Hi gang, so this is our lesson on bone. Let's start with an overview of the lesson. This lesson is osteology or the study of bone. We will begin by examining the functions of bone, which include structural support, movement, protection, mineral storage, and blood cell production. We will then examine the anatomy of bone, starting with the parts of the bone and the different types of bone tissue, including compact and trabecular bone. We will then zoom down and we will look at different types of bone cells, including osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Those bones are important for understanding how bone adapts and what makes for a healthy bone. We will then start to zoom back out and we'll look at bones classified according to their shape, including long bones, short bones, flat bones, irregular bones, and sesamoid bones. We will then look at how the skeletal system is organized before looking at the individual bones of the lower extremity, trunk, and upper extremity. For each bone, I'm going to expect you to know its proper name, its location relative to other bones around it, and some significant landmarks on that bone. Now that you have an idea about what we're talking about, let's get into it. We will begin our study of bone by outlining their functions. First, bone provides structural support. Just look at how all the organs in the picture are arranged. Without bone, they'd all be collapsed on top of one another. You'd look like a big soup sandwich, if you can visualize that. Next, bone provides a series of levers by which we move. You can think of bones as being a series of fulcrums with the joints as the pivot points. It is in this role that we are most interested in for this class. Other functions of bone include protection. The most vulnerable parts of our body are encased in bone. Bone also acts as a storehouse for minerals, such as calcium. Calcium is needed for muscle contractions. So if we're ever deficient in calcium, we have a supply readily available. Finally, bone produces blood cells. But as I said, we are primarily interested in this class in bones function in the production of movement. Now let's take a look at the anatomy of bones. On a macro level, we can look at a long bone as a shaft or diaphysis with two knobby ends called epiphyses. The epiphyseal growth plate is what allows the bones to increase in size for children. On the micro level, there are two types of bone tissue, compact or cortical bone and trabecular or spongy bone. Both types of bone are made up of the same stuff, just in different proportions. The compact bone is the superficial layer of the bone, and the amount of that bone doesn't change much in adulthood. The deep layers of bone are made up of trabecular bone. Trabecular bone acts as struts that give bone their strength. The amount of trabecular bone will change throughout your lifetime in response to activity and nutrition. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But first, let's drill down a little bit deeper to the level of cells. We have three types of bone cells. Osteocytes are the mature bone cells. Osteoblasts are responsible for bone growth, while osteoclasts resorb bone. Those cells interact to determine how bone adapts and consequently how healthy it is. Before we get into how that happens, we need to talk about a few more terms. Bone mineral content is the total amount of bone while bone mineral density is how much bone there is in any given area. Because it is what we call normalized, bone mineral density is usually considered a better measure of bone health. Osteopenia is a general loss of bone, whereas osteoporosis is a severe loss of bone. So how does one change the amount of bone? This is a process known as remodeling. With remodeling, there is an interplay between osteoclastic activity and osteoblastic activity. Osteoclasts come in and remove old bone so the osteoblast can come in and lay down new bone. If you ever get confused, remember osteoblasts with a B are the builders. Let's take a look at this process a little closer. In this example, the pale yellow outline is going to represent cortical bone. Trabecular bone is represented in light blue. Osteoclasts come in and remove old bone so the osteoblast can come in and lay down new bone, depicted here in dark blue. If the osteoclast and osteoblast activity are equal, then the amount of bone mineral density won't change. This is what happens on a regular day-to-day -day basis when we are constantly remodeling bone. Now, if the osteoblast activity is greater than the osteoclast activity, then we will see an increase in bone mineral density. 
And if the osteoclast activity is greater than the osteoblast activity, there will be a decrease in bone mineral density. We should also note that the changes in bone mineral density are occurring primarily with trabecular bone. The amount of cortical bone in adulthood is fairly constant. So now that we know that the amount of bone mineral density can change, let's take a look at some of the factors that increase or decrease it. The first is aging. We know that in children there is an increase in bone mineral density, while there is a decrease in bone mineral density in the elderly. And through most of the adult years, all things being equal, we have a fairly constant amount of bone. Here I've created a simple model of bone mineral density changes with aging. Notice that we see a rapid rise in bone mineral density until we reach a peak, which we will say occurs predominantly in the early 20s. Yes, for most of you, you are now hitting your peak in bone mineral density. After that, it's all downhill. So yes, I'm losing bone mineral density. But does that mean it's hopeless? Absolutely not. While we have to lose bone mineral density with age, nothing says that the decline is fixed. Notice how we can slow the decline in bone mineral density. The choice is ours. We can see here with the dark blue line, that was my normal model. But with the blue dashed line, we can see that we can slow that decline if we make the right choices. It also stands to reason that if we lose bone mineral density while we age, then it's best if we can increase the amount of bone mineral density while we're still young. Notice here that we have the same rate of decline in bone mineral density with age, but red started out higher than blue. So at any age, red will have more bone mineral density than blue. Now, of course, the best thing to do would be to combine both strategies, increase the bone mineral density while we're young, and decrease the rate of decline. Notice that the red dashed line at 100 is the same height as the blue line is at 21. So how do we do that? Like most things in life, it comes down to two things, diet and exercise. Diet plays an important part in bone health. Foods high in calcium, vitamin D, vitamin C, and protein are all associated with increased in bone health, while foods high in phosphorus, fats, and sugars are all associated with a decrease in bone health. So if we divide the slide in half, here we can see that the foods on the left are good, and the foods on the right, eh, not so much. Exercise can also improve bone mineral density but not all exercises are equally beneficial. Exercises that have been shown to increase bone mineral density are novel, meaning new. This means that you're not subjecting the body to the same repetitive movements over and over again. They also have to have moderate forces and high loading rate. Now, what do I mean by a high loading rate? I can apply the same force over different time frames. If I apply the force relatively slowly, then I have a low loading rate. Think of this as being a slow crush. If I apply that same amount of force very rapidly, then I have a high loading rate. Think impacts. So we can think of loading rate as the force divided by the time it takes to apply that force. One thing I'm going to ask you to consider in the prep guide is whether or not all exercises are created equal when it comes to bone health and to give examples of exercise that stimulate bone development. Low estrogen levels create an imbalance in osteoclast and osteoblast activity with more bone resorption than deposition. So postmenopausal women are particularly at risk for osteoporosis. But it's not just postmenopausal women. Any woman without a regular period may have a decrease in estrogen levels. So women on birth control have to make sure that they are doing the right things for bone health. Some women athletes may experience what's known as the female athlete triad. This involves low energy availability, either with or without disordered eating. This means they are taking in less energy than they need. This creates the double whammy of less good stuff needed for bone health, as well as decrease in estrogen levels. This leads to a loss of the period, known as amenorrhea, and potentially osteoporosis. And remember, this is usually occurring at a time when we're looking to increase our peak bone mineral density. Now that we've zoomed into the micro level of bone, let's zoom back out and take a look at how bones are classified according to their shape. Bones can be classified as either long, short, flat, irregular, or sesamoid. 
Long bones are not necessarily long, but roughly rectangular. Short bones are not necessarily short, but roughly square. Black bones, as the name suggests, do not have much depth. Irregular bones are ob-shaped. The final classification of the sesamoid bone, which is not really a shape, but it's a bone that's embedded in soft tissue. If we zoom out a bit further, we can look at how the skeletal system is organized. The skeletal system is classified into two parts. The axial skeleton, depicted here in teal, includes the skull, ribs, sternum, and vertebral column. Everything else is considered an appendicular skeleton, which we will divide further into the lower extremity and the upper extremity. Note that the pelvis and the scapula are part of the appendicular skeleton. So let's review what we've learned so far. This lesson was about osteology, the study of bone. We began by examining the functions of bone, including its role in structural support, movement, protection, mineral storage, and blood cell production. We then examined the anatomy of bone, starting with the parts of the bone and then the different types of bone tissue. We then zoomed down and we looked at the different types of bone cells. We saw how those bone cells were important for understanding how bone adapts and what makes for a healthy bone. We then zoomed out and we looked at bones as they were classified by shape. We looked at how the skeletal system is organized before looking at the individual bones of the lower extremity, trunk, and upper extremity. And remember, for each bone, you need to know its proper name, its location relative to the bones around it, and some significant landmarks on that bone. Now it's time to turn our attention to the individual bones of the human body, which will be covered in a different set of videos.